Greetings once again, everybody. Elder Teddy Wilson with the Seekers of Yah Ministries website at Yahweh's Messianic Message.com. Uh, since last week, or well, not last week, but the last clip that we, we recorded, uh, I was going over uh, some things I need to clear up real quick. Um, in the last disc, when I was speaking about uh, Balaam and Balak, I actually used Balaam's name where Balak's name should have been used, and I wanted to clear that up. Uh, Balak was the one wanting to curse Israel, and Balaam, of course, refused to do it. Just to clarify that. Um, also, um, let's get right into it uh, in the recording of this clip, and uh, let's 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 pray. Hallelujah, Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. And as we study your word, Father, um, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit. We ask that your spirit, your Ruach, would be present with us, Father. Lead us and guide us into all truth. Open our minds and our understanding and bless us with wisdom and knowledge that comes from you, Father. We praise you. We thank you so much for the blood of your son. We praise you, Yahshua. Hallelujah. We ask that everything that we... Uh, study tonight would exalt your name and would would just enlighten us father and would bring glory to you we pray and ask all of this father in the precious name of your son yahushua hamashiach amen hallelujah okay uh real quick um in the last clip when we were going over uh i believe it was romans 10 verse 4 where it's in most English translations, it says that Messiah was the end of the law. Remember, we covered that pretty well, but I happened to have, and I and I forgot that I had it at the time that we were studying that. I have here a Nelson's Study Bible, Nelson's Complete Study System Bible. Okay, now if you remember right. I was saying that in, in a lot of these newer translations of the King James or New King James, you'll find footnotes that declare that that word should not have been left translated as end, but that it would should have been uh, translated as goal. Well, guess what this has in it? Footnotes. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and read verse 10, or excuse me, chapter 10, verse 4 out of Romans. Uh, out of out of the New King James, then we'll read the footnote, then we'll read the way it reads out of the scriptures, which I use to teach from. Okay, get your Bibles, your scriptures, whatever you have, open it up and and let's let's study, let's let's praise and exalt and search for the one that gives us life. Hallelujah. Let the truth of these things that we've been studying be made manifest. Hallelujah. Let's let's read this. Uh, at chapter 10 and at verse 4, this New King James Study Bible, placed by the Nelsons. Verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, this is something that I've, I've stated in the past. See, Christ Jesus and the teachings that comes with him under, under the Greek, under the Greek, uh, mindset that we have received does do away with the law. However, Yahshua Messiah and the, uh, Hebrew mindset doesn't. You see the difference. See, there's there's two different things that we're being taught from the word under two different names. One of these names, the Greek name, the doctrine that comes with that is that the law was done away with, that, that, that Yahweh's commandments was done away with. However, in the Messianic movement or the Torah, uh, uh, the Hebrew roots or, or Torah observant groups, it, it, that's not the case. Do you see the difference? 
I mean, make your choice. Choose which one you're going to believe because we have we have proven without a doubt. If you're still watching this this uh, DVD series, I believe that if you were not then when you started watching this DVD series, that by now that you should be pretty much thoroughly convinced that Shaul was not only teaching Torah principles, but that he was Torah observant along with all of the rest of the apostles and disciples. Okay, and that's what he was teaching from. Hallelujah. So here we see that the Nelson says that uh, Messiah was the end of the law. Now, any of you that possess this can go down here to the footnotes and verify what I'm about to read. I'm going to read you word for word what these footnotes say about that verse. Now, first off, I want to say that most sacred name Bibles, okay, have taken the translation and put the sacred name back where it belongs. So therefore, it has 6,823 or 24, whichever, I mean, the number varies, but 6,823 times in my book, okay, that it has reestablished the name of Yahweh where it needs to be, in its rightful place, where it was in the original manuscripts. So therefore, most, if not all, sacred name Bibles have 6,823 less mistakes in it. Now, let's do 6,824, five, okay, less. I'm going to show you that right now. Remember what we studied uh, in the last clip. Here's the footnote. Chapter 10 and verse 4. End can mean fulfillment that is Christ fulfilled all of the requirements of the law. Now watch this. It can also mean goal. You see this? To say Christ was the object which the law led. Do you understand what they're saying here? They're admitting that goal would be a better translation to this. How do we know that? Let's go back. It says that Christ is the end of the law. Correct? Okay, but if you put goal there, it changes the whole context of that verse. It doesn't mean stopped like we studied last week. We don't have to go back into it. But they admittedly say that goal should be used there. Now, I'm going to read it to you out of the scriptures. Listen to the context. Listen to what it projects in the Nelsons, New King James. For Christ is the end of the law. But then they say down here in these small little footnotes that goal can be used there. And it should. Now you'll see what that shows us. It gives us a picture that the law is gone, done away with in the Messiah. Okay? Now, let's read it out of the scriptures. Chapter 10 and verse 4. For Messiah is the goal, which they admit should be used there, of the Torah, unto righteousness to everyone who believes. You see the two different uh, meanings that is projected, one under Christ Jesus, one under Yahshua Messiah. Take your pick, guys. Did Yahshua do away with the commandments of his father? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <clears throat> All right. So, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, and start with this because later on in the study tonight we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do chapter twelve and thirteen in this clip because once we get into fourteen and fifteen and sixteen we're gonna have to do all three of those in one clip and that'll be the final clip okay and we'll be done with this series okay um so what 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 I want to do is kind of recap everything that we've we've learned up to this point surely we understand that Yahshua did not do, do away with the commandments and that Shaul was not teaching against Torah precepts. 
We've seen that. Without a doubt, uh, Scripture has verified that. We went back into the Law and the Prophets and 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 just verified it over and over and over. And we're going to continue to do that till the time this recording stops for good. This stuff is true. Okay. What I want to do is I want to make a, a very bold statement. Up until this point, and all the way through the end of this book, and in all of his other writings, by the way, Shaul never once taught against Torah precepts, Torah observance, or to not place yourself under the rule of Yahweh's commandments. Never, not once. Now, what we do see in Scripture is that the law wasn't changed, but there was a change in the law because because of Yahshua. Okay? Now, I want to go to a, 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 a specific set of verses right now to verify what I just said because we're going to need that verification when we get into uh, either later in chapter 13 or you know somewhere during this study. We're going to need to understand what, what we're talking about here. Okay? So, if everybody would uh, open up to the book of Hebrews in, in chapter 7. We're going to discuss what the Bible says, what your scriptures right in front of you say concerning the law or the Torah. Okay? The writer of the book of Hebrews has this to say about the law. Nowhere does it say that it's over. Nowhere. Nowhere in the New Testament. Except for in a few mistranslations. And we've already proven that, that those things should have, should be corrected. And in most sacred name versions of the Bible, it is. Okay? So now let's verify all of this. Let's put a little icing on the cake. Okay? Go to uh, Ibram, Hebrews, chapter 7. And we're going to read 11 through 14. Truly then... If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, which is in the Torah, right? For under it, the people were given the Torah. Now, what law? Okay? Of sacrifice. <laughs> we're going to see, uh, especially when we get into the teaching of uh, uh, chapter 15, that there is still a sacrificial system going on here. Okay, and I don't want to get too far into that, but a lot of you are probably scratching your head thinking, really, uh, you know, that sounds kind of Levitical. Well, guess what? The Levitical priesthood is not in operation right now. But there is a sacrificial system according to Scripture in the New Testament, in the Messianic Scriptures, in Brit Hadashah. Okay? Uh, for under it, uh, the people were given the Torah, why was there still a need for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of a necessity, there takes place a change of the law as also. You see this? The Bible does not say that the law was done away with. Now this is the book of Hebrews. It says that the law that existed, that they were still following, because Messiah came and the Levitical priesthood was moved out of the way for the present time, as we know it. It's not in operation. There is no temple. Okay? That there had to be a change in the law. So this proves that they were still following the Torah commandments, but there, since Messiah had came, there was a change in it. A change of it. But it was not removed. Hallelujah. It still existed in the first century assemblies. And it should still exist in this day and age within the body of Yahshua Messiah. Now we're going to see why there was there needed to be a change in the law. In it. A change in it. It, it existed, but something needed to be re revamped real quick. Okay? For he of whom it for he of whom this is said belongs to another tribe. Yahshua wasn't from the tribe of Levi. See this? 
from which no one had attended at the altar. So at the altar on this earth in the temples here, nobody except for a Levite was able to, to take care of the things that pertained to temple worship at the altar other than Levites. So Yahshua was from the tribe of Judah. So there had to be a change in the law, of the law, not the law be removed. Verse 14, for it is perfectly clear that our master arose from Yehuda. He sprang up. Most of your English versions are, are reading right there. That it is evident that our Messiah, Yahshua, sprang up from the tribe of Yehuda, of Judah. A tribe which Moshe never spoke of concerning the priesthood. You see that? So there had to be a change in the law. So we go back to the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Now that's a whole other teaching in itself, but I just wanted to go through that real quick to, to, to show and produce biblical evidence that the law was still being practiced within the first century, assemb first century assembly. However, there was a change in it and of it, not it was done away with. The Bible never teaches that, ever. And there's biblical evidence to prove it. All right. So let's get into chapter 12. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2. Now, now that we've covered 6, 7, and 8, 9, 10, 11, okay, and, and, the, and the previous, a lot of the previous chapters that we went through had, there were so many things that had to be uh, discussed, researched, and proven by scripture uh, in order in order to produce the evidence that Shaul was not or has not nor will he ever uh, did he ever intend to do away with Torah observance okay so now that we're winding down we've already got most of that stuff proven discussed studied and restudied but there's still some things that we need to touch on as this as this letter that he wrote comes to a close Okay, but it's, it's very, very uh, relevant, and and uh, one of them is uh, the sacrificial system that I was speaking about earlier. We'll get into that in the next clip. Let's read verses 1 and 2 in chapter 12. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering. You see this? Remember what I was saying, that there is still a sacrificial system in the assembly within the body of Yahshua. See this? A living sacrifice. A living offering. So if we're supposed to present ourselves as living offerings, a living sacrifice, then there must be a sacrificial service still being practiced, or was at least, by the first century assembly and by anybody who truly follows Yahshua Messiah. It still exists. Set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, which is your reasonable worship, your reasonable service, a lot, a lot of your translations read. Okay, what I want to do is kind of touch on the Hebrew meaning here. Okay, um, what he's speaking about in the reasonable service or reasonable worship is the Hebrew avodah. Okay, and, and and it's it's our reasonable service to 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 Yahweh through Yahshua. There is a service still here. Okay, and it's got something to do with offerings and sacrifices. We are living sacrifices. Okay, so yes, there is still a sacrificial system observed within the body of Yahshua. And do not be, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. This is what Yahshua did. He completed the desire. He always had Yahweh's concern, uh, his wishes. 
um, was the first thing to fulfill Yahweh's will and, and his wishes was the first thing on Yahshua's mind. Let the same mind be in you that was also in Yahshua Messiah, the word tells us. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see exactly what this is talking about tonight. Okay, because we need to understand what was on Yahshua's mind. Okay, that scripture had says a lot. Hallelujah. Okay. So, let's go ahead. Let's read back over this real quick. And do not be conformed to this world. Okay, because that's where your mind at is at. Okay, previ uh, previously to coming into the body of Yahshua. Your mind is of the world. It's carnal. Okay, so something is supposed to renew your mind and direct your thoughts and intentions in another direction. And it's supposed to be renewed and transformed into Yahshua's mind, the way he thought, the way he acted, so it can produce the same walk that he walked, which was acceptable in the sight of Elohim. The Torah being placed in your heart does this. Watch. Remember, by the renewing of your mind, we got to understand that this was coming from a Hebrew man who knew the Torah inside and out by heart. Remember, we talked about that. So let's go back and see exactly what Shaul is, is referring to here. The renewing of your mind. How does that take place if you've had the world in your mind for so long? And all of your thoughts are fleshly and carnal. And that separating you from the love of Elohim, then what do you do to retrain your thinking? And to make the same mind be in you that was also in Yahshua. You've got to think about fulfilling the same things that Yahshua fulfilled. There's no other way to do it. So what do you do? You read. Let it enter your heart. Let it flow from your mouth, and it will control your thinking. We've got to reprogram ourselves. How do we do that? The written word of Yahweh. If you do away with the law and the prophets, you do away with that word. And you begin to live what some say is acceptable in the sight of Yahweh just by believing. But that's just not true. How do you make your mind changed and be obedient like Yahshua's was? Hallelujah. Okay, let us go to uh, Deuteronomy. And at chapter 6. Now remember, these people just came out of bondage. Just came out of Egypt. Okay? You and I, when we repent, it's a sign of that. We come out of Egypt, out of bondage. So what are we supposed to do? We do this. We do this. Just like those people did. We are we enter covenant with him. Okay? And you cannot do that without submitting yourself to his word and placing yourself under his rule. Chapter 6 in, in Debarim, Deuteronomy, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is one. Yahweh is not a trinity, a trinity or anything else. He is in Hebrew here, Ichad. Ichad represents the number one. And it's also been taught that it means one in unity. Okay, that is an English word, unity, that was not found in the original. It means one. That's it. It means one. By the way, that is a command. When Yahshua was asked, what is, the, uh, uh, what is the greatest command? He said the Shema. This is the Shema. It's a statement of faith. Um, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is one. We are commanded as his, as his followers, and Yahshua said this, we are commanded to believe that Yahweh is one. The word unity, when you look that up in the Strong's, is in regular print, and therefore it is a man's addition to the definition. It means one. Verse 5. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all of your heart, and with all your being, and with all of your might. 
And these words, you see this? Here's the word. And these words which I am commanding you to, the commandments that we see in the word, that I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. See? This is what you put in your heart. His word. You put that word in your heart. It begins to do things to this and to this. Watch. Verse 7. And you shall impress them upon your children. Not only are you supposed to walk this way, but you're supposed to teach them to your children. Okay? And shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Now, now watch this closely. How do you change your mind? How do you change your thinking process? Taking his word, putting it into your heart, and when his hurt, word is in your heart, it produces something. It pr produces love. That's what the commandments produce is love. They show you how to love not only your fellow man and Yahweh's creation, but Yahweh himself. Listen to verse 8. This is how you change your thinking, your mind, into thinking like Yahshua thought. Verse 8. And shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall, shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You see this? They're always supposed to be right here. A frontlet between your eyes means they will always be on your mind. You will always see them. You will always have them in your heart. You will always possess them when you lie down, when you come in, when you go out. They will always be before you. When you see his commandments, when they're in your heart, it changes your mind, your thinking. That's how we allow the same mind to be in us that was also in Yahshua, is to let these commandments not only be in our heart, but be as frontlets before our eyes. You'll never be able to get them off your mind. <laughs> what you see and what you have in your heart will control this and your thoughts. That is Hebrew mind thought. That is Hebrew teaching. Verse 9. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Represent. I got Yahweh's name on my door. Spray painted in red. Okay? They're on my heart. I'm letting everybody know that comes into this vicinity. This is what I am, who I am, who I serve. And it's on the doorpost of my heart. So therefore my thoughts, everywhere I look, I see Yahweh. I see his commandments. I have his Torah in my heart. And it produces love. So this is how we can form our, our, ourselves. Okay? Transform. Hallelujah. Is by, is by doing this. Then if we do that, then everything that Yahshua was thinking about while he was here which is fulfilling Yahweh's commandments, will also be on your heart and your mind. And that's how we keep our mind geared to stay like Yahshua's mind. Placing the commandments there. Hallelujah. Yahweh's word. We just read it. Hallelujah. Okay. So let's go to verses 18 and 20. Now watch this. In order to understand the severity of, of understanding Shaul's writings, these two verses need to be very clearly taught and understood, not only by me, but by anybody. Okay, because these are Old Testament teachings. Okay? This, I, I can't stress this enough for everybody to understand what Shaul is teaching in these two verses. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to research that. Okay? Chapter 12, verses uh, 18 through 20. If possible, on your part, be at peace with all men. That means with every ounce of your being, you are to try to get along with all people, whether they believe in Yahshua, whether they believe in whatever. 
whether they've done you good, whether they've done you wrong. You are always supposed to strive to try your best to get along with people. But this is also showing us that we won't always be able to get along with everybody. Okay? Verse 19. Beloved, do not revenge yourselves, but give place to wrath. For it has been written, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says Yahweh. Verse 20. Instead, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. You see, if you fulfill the commandments and you try with all of your heart, with all of your being, to get along with everybody, with Yahweh's creation, okay, the enemies that rise up against you sooner or later, later, excuse me, Yahweh will deal with these people. We're going to see it. Now, what I can't stress enough is to under, we need to understand verse 19. Listen to what he says. Beloved, do not revenge yourselves, but give place to wrath. For it has been written, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, saith Yahweh. Those are very deep words. What we need to understand is, what wrath is he talking about here? Okay, and vengeance on who? Why, why would there be vengeance involved if we're talking to a bunch of people that um, had received Yahshua? Okay? He's fixing to, to re, what he's doing is revealing a Torah principle to us here. Hallelujah. Now, to see what I'm talking about, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay, we're going to look at two, two different sets of verses here. Let's look at, first we'll look at 35 and 36 in chapter 32 of, of Devarim. Okay, where is Shaul getting this? See, there's vengeance going to take place on people here. That's what he's showing us. The vengeance that we're fixing to see that he's, he's still referring to is those who are enemies of Yahweh. Those who will not submit to the rule of Yahweh's kingdom. You see, Yahshua didn't do away with Yahweh's kingdom rules. Once you enter into the kingdom, you must obey the rules. Or, if that wasn't the case, and those rules had changed, now that the Messiah had come, there would be no longer a need for us to be uh, warned of vengeance that's going to come upon people that are disobedient to Yahweh's government. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, in the sixth book that Shaul wrote, Romans, the book of Romans, he's saying that this vengeance will still be carried out to the enemies who are still defined as people who break Yahweh's commandments. We're going to define that right now. There's many different places that you can look up the definition of what he's speaking about in the Tanakh or Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. We're just going to look at a few. Okay? But get your pencils ready because I'm going to uh, just give you reference to some, some, uh, uh, some chapters in the book of Psalms as well. For this... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. Now, when you do these things, when you follow those commandments, that means that you are com that you are completing a meets vote in the Hebrew thought. In other words, when you when you get mad and you say, you know what, I'm not gonna have those feelings towards that man, instead of go ahead and running over there, getting your gun and shooting the guy, okay, then you have completed a meets vote in Yahweh's eyes. You have fulfilled a good deed. And that's what type of completion he's talking about here. That if you love your neighbor, okay, if you truly love him, that you are fulfilling, completing a meets vote. Because your thoughts and intentions toward that person are not evil, but good. 
you're completing a mitzvot, a good deed. When you practice love, when you love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what he's talking about. Not that it's over. None of the definitions in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, or English of that word mean that. That it's over. It doesn't, that's not, that's not the definition. That's not what Shaul was saying. He was saying that if you do these things, if you love, if you truly love your, your neighbor and everybody else around you, if you truly love them like Yahshua did, that was on, what was on Yahshua's mind was loving his creation. Okay? And, and being obedient to his father. Okay? He completed mitzvot. He completed the laws. He completed the Torah. You understand? In his walk on in life. Not that it was over, done away with, but that he completed these things in his walk on life and in life. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Shaul was teaching us here. Okay, let's see. We're going to finish up chapter 13 and we're going to stop right there because once we get into 14, we're going to get into some teachings on the food laws. And all kinds of verses that have been pulled out of context, and we're going to have to do a, a huge study. And in the 15th chapter is going to be the teaching on the uh, sacrificial elements or the, the sacrificial services that I was speaking about earlier still being present within the body of Messiah. Living sacrifices, remember that. Remember, because used to, sacrif sacrifices died at the altar. Okay, Now they come to the altar, I'll give you a hint. Now when you bring a sacrifice to the altar, it lives. That's what happens in Messiah. Hallelujah. We'll get more into that in the next clip. Let's finish up tonight with uh, verses 13 and 14 in chapter 13. Let us walk. And by the way, in Hebrew, that word walk would be halakha. And remember, our halakha is supposed to be like Yahshua's halakha. So, let our let us walk becomingly, as in the day, not in wild parties and drunkenness, not in living together and indecencies, not in fighting and envy. See, he's he's showing you the difference between love and wickedness. Love produces peace, fulfilling of mitzvot, uh, living together and doing indecent things. Uh, fighting and then being full of, full of envy, that means that you're not walking in the same walk of Yahshua. Verse 14, but put on the master Yahshua Messiah. You see this? Do what he did. You should be able to look in the mirror and say, I see Yahshua in me now that, now that I live like he lived. Hallelujah. Now that I live like he lived, I can see Yahshua in me, and other people will see Yahshua in you when you put him on. Do the things. What he's saying here is um, mimic him. Do as he did. Put on that garment that he wore. Make yourself look right in the eyes of Yahweh Almighty by being in the image and walking like his son. Put on the Master Yahshua Messiah and make no provision for the lusts of the flesh. You see this? How do you keep the lusts of the flesh? You keep the commandments as a frontlet before your eyes. We just read that. If you keep the commandments as a frontlet before your eyes like Yahshua did, okay, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Therefore, you will lead a life of righteousness in the sight of Yahweh, and you'll be more like his son, Yahshua, who was obedient. He was even obedient to the point of death, of the stake. How many of us possess that type of obedience? How many of us have even desired to have that? Let's search ourselves. Let's be real. Because that's what it takes, is to have the desire and the zeal to complete meets votes. The fulfilling of the commandments in the eyes of Yahweh for us to be partakers of his kingdom and live under his reign. Hallelujah. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we praise you this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your guidance. Father, we thank you for the example that you gave us in your son, Yahshua. We thank you, Father, for giving us uh, the breath of life, the blood that was shed. We thank you for giving us opportunity to repent from our old man and to return unto you, a new man. And the only way that we can do that is through the door, who is your son. Let us enter your sheepfold, Father, according to your word. Help us to understand that obedience, walking right, loving one another, is the keys to your kingdom, Father. To be more like your son. Thank you for your Torah. Thank you for your Ruach. Thank you for your Devar, your word. We give you praise and honor and thanksgiving. And we pray this in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I hope you're enjoying yourself. And until the next clip, which will be the final one, Yahweh bless you and Baruch Hashem.